This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. The singing you can hear in the background is from the St. Patrick's Athletic fans because for the third time this season they have beaten Shelburne by one goal to nil. The other headlines from, well, tonight as I talk, Saturday as you listen, Dundalk came from 1-0 down to get a 2-1 win away to Drogheda. Patrick Hoobin is now the club's leading scorer. And Shamrock Rovers, well, they were 2-0 up against Bowles, but Bowles got two goals to get a two-all draw. UCD, who are the living embodiment of the Undertaker gift, have beaten Sligo Rovers by two goals to one, while Derry overcame Cork City. Keith Tracy, formerly of St. Pat's and the Republic of Ireland, amongst others. You watch this game on LOI TV with me. St. Pat's beating Shells by one goal to nil. Jake Mulraney, he got a fantastic goal to win at a free kick. His fifth of the season, probably his best goal of the season so far. Did St. Pat's deserve it or are Shells unlucky not to get something from Richmond Park this evening as we chat? I think I think Shelbourne were very unlucky. I think if we have a look at the stats and you break the you break the game down, Shelbourne were probably better in, in every department. Pass and accuracy was better. The the possession of the ball was better. Attempts was probably a little bit shaded by by Shelbourne. But the only stat that matters is the goal stat. And Pat's just managed to managed to find a way to put the ball in the back of the net. And I could point the finger at a couple of couple of players. Chris Forrest are very very quiet about Pat tonight in an attacking sense. But put the work in, and that's what John Daly demanded with. With the draw of the performance being uh, so fresh in the mind, saying they were outworked, they weren't outworked tonight. And sometimes, when you're not having a, a great game with the ball, all you can demand from your players is that they work hard. And Pat's worked hard, and Jake Mulraney just that little bit of talent separates the two teams. This will seem like a silly question. Shelburne had a lot of possession, a lot of chances. Why couldn't they score? I, honestly, I, I think that's just the the difference between the two teams. Of Sean Boy, Jack uh, Moyle, and very very decent players just struggled to put the ball into the back of the net and I, I do think it was quality of chance as well I don't think Pats had better chances to say but they just looked more threatening when he went forward more capable of hitting the back of the net and like I say had it been a nil all draw I think that would have been a fair result but Jake Mulraney's free kick is a, it's a free kick that could win any game but Shells don't score a whole pile of goals coming into last night's games they were joint second with Drogheda and Sligo for the least goal scores those two teams have just jumped ahead of them because despite the fact that they lost they did both score uh, this evening they're only ahead of them by one goal um, what about St. Pat's they found a way to win and that's a good sign of a team yeah that, that was me, me next point sometimes in a, especially if they, if they want to be in a title race they the remake for the season was to get into Europe they definitely look like they're getting into Europe playing really really well and Today, they didn't play too well, O'Shea, but they found a way to get over the line. For long periods in this game, I thought Shelbourne were the better team, but Pat's just shown that little bit of backbone, that little bit of resilience to say, yeah, we can soak up pressure and we'll find a way to win the game. And that's, like we say, that's what all good teams manage to do, especially at home. There was a few good performances from St. Pat's this evening, but two people who stood out were Noah Lewis and Jamie Lennon. Yeah, Jamie Lennon, full of running, puts in the work, you know, every game he gives 100%, but Noah Lewis, I think we should give a special mention to. We said he's probably not the fourth choice centre half if Grigovsky and uh, Redmond are fit, but he was a magnet in the second half, won everything, balls into the box. And Shelbourne did start to turn that screw a little bit more as the game went on, but Noah Lewis was an absolute magnet in there. Everything that came into the box, he managed to get forced contact on. More often than not, he was getting the second contact as well. An absolute rock back there, and yeah, very, very close to being my man of the match. Chris Forrester, not overly brilliant in this game, but you know, popped up at times. There was an argument that maybe he should have been in the Ireland squad, given that League of Ireland players are at the peak of their fitness at this time of year, and some of the guys who were in the Championship in League One or whatever looked a bit tired. Do you buy into that argument, or where 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 do you uh, where does that sit with you? I think it's very difficult. Look, I think it's I think it's an interesting argument. I know what you're saying about the English boys or the the English base boys being being out of season and maybe just having two or three weeks where they're not really quite at it, but. I just think it's very, very deep water. I think if it's a friendly or a training camp, then by all means, bring Chris, Car- Chris Forrest or let him, ha- let him have a look at it, get, dip his toe into the water. But in terms of actually bringing him into the Greece game or bringing him into the Gibraltar game, it's very, very deep water. And you feel like you have a, a personal responsibility to a player. You can't just throw lads in like that. You look at Will Smallbone played against Greece. That was his competitive debut. Really, really tough water, deep water to be in didn't play too well and in hindsight maybe it was the wrong decision so the last thing you'd want is to put a League of Ireland player in there and not to do himself justice but I understand the argument though Shane but very very tough to uh, to say he should be in it St Pat's play again on Monday night against Dundalk that's in Oriel Park it's a tough one isn't it and it's a tough and tight turnaround especially when you consider 
the energy that they would have um, expended tonight on a warm, sticky night, and also the fact that they'd be playing on that surface that, that does tend to just take that bit more out of players. Yeah, the 4G definitely does take that little bit more out of the players. And you're looking at Pats going into the, the last 20 minutes of this game. Chris Forrest was holding his groin, holding his hamstring. There's one or two others going down with cramps. So, look, at will all be about who recovers the better this weekend. You would imagine that Pats will be in the ice bath tomorrow, getting massages, stretching out, little bits of yoga here and there. But they'll know the 4G pitch is coming on Monday night. And if they can get the win, they have some favourable fixtures at home then over the next couple of Fridays. So if they can go and get the three points against Dundalk, you would imagine that John Day, look, there is no easy games in this league, but you would imagine on paper, you would expect Pats to, to rack up a couple of points now over the next couple of weeks. We'll have more on St. Pats on Monday night because we will be doing a podcast then. But what about those fans off to our left as we look at the shed end here of uh, Richmond Park? They're stunned into silence at the moment, the Shelburne supporters, but there's some reasons to be cheerful, isn't there? And they are building something. Now, the, the question is, is, a lot of money will come into the club. How does Damien Duff actually change things around? Does he keep playing the way he's playing until he gets a new batch of players? Or what way do you approach it? How could that change things and how difficult will that transition be? Well, I'm not too sure. What I, I spoke to Damien personally the last time we, uh, the last time Pat's played Shells in Talca Park, and he was saying that if they were to come into a bit of money, he would put he would put a lot of emphasis on the training ground and the academy and bringing bringing players through. So if Damien's true to his word, I think the money might be spent a little bit behind the scenes, which will obviously filter up onto the pitch over the years. But it looks like Damien is going to go down the academy route, the, the uh, bringing players through. So if that is the case, you know. So be it. And look, I think Shelbourne are not far off. Again, it's very, very, very easy to forget that this is only their second season in the Premier League and they're competing at a level that is probably above where they should be right now. OK, Keith Tracy, thank you very much for joining us here at Richmond Park. This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. We'll be going around the grounds very shortly to find out how Bohemians came back from 2-0 down to get a 2 all draw against uh, Shamrock Rovers. We'll hear from uh, Gareth McGlynn, who watched Derry City overcome Cork City. And there is more. Uh, Sligo Rovers getting well beaten by UCD tonight. Two goals to one, the final score there. Paul Crowley, formerly of uh, Drogheda United, watched them lose to Dundalk. We'll hear from him shortly. But first, I'm going to run over and do post-match interviews here in Richmond Park, and you are about to hear them right now. Damien, have you lost a game that you could have drawn or perhaps even won? Yeah, I think you've answered it's your own question. Um, here, hats off to them. Uh, good three points for John. Uh, great free kick from from Jake Mulraney. He's a game changer. That's why they moved Heaven and Earth to get him in the in the club. So uh, at the end of the day, yeah, as good as we were, um, they have come away with the three points. How frustrating was it that your team had chances but couldn't score? And what do you put it down to? Listen, we move on. I'm, I never um, put pressure on the guys to score the goals. Um, so all I look at is the all-round performance. Obviously, individual performances. As good as a performance you'll see at Richmond Park from the Shelburne team. Like I said, we, we haven't uh, got out from the game, which is disappointing. How do you react to it? Like, what do you take from it lesson wise? Obviously, to take your chances, and you know, even if you strip back the, where they won the free kick on from, you can look into that in many different ways as well. But uh, you can dwell on things for too long as well. So, yeah, we'll. We'll do a post-match. At the end of the day, it's Monday. Uh, we'll be preparing for Derry, so it's as simple as that. We move on quickly in football. Cheers, Damien. Thank you. John, a 1-0 victory. Does this go down as a game that you had to fight for, maybe didn't play overly well in, but you got the result, and from the manager's point of view, that's a real positive? I, don't, I wouldn't say it was a game we didn't play particularly well in. I think you have to give a lot of credit to Shelbourne. I thought for the first maybe 30, 35 minutes, they they done some good stuff. They overloaded the sides of the pitch, um, which causes a lot of problems, dragging our full backs inside, our wing backs overlapping. So I think that causes a lot of problems. Um, I think when we change shape to a back three and, and we match them up with the wing backs and the box midfield, um, I think from that moment on, I thought we were very dominant. Jake Mulraney, what a moment of quality. Unbelievable. Um, he does that a lot in training. Um, you know, he practices, practices him along with um, a few other lads as well. So, um, fantastic finish and, and obviously delighted um, that it's, it's got us the three points. Damien Duff and John Daly reacting to the 1-0 win for the Saints against Shells. Right, let's go around the grounds. We start at Daly Mount Park, former Bohemians defender and huge Bulls fan. I don't think he'd mind me saying that on here. On Bulls 2 all draw with Shamrock Rovers. He was at the game at Daly Mount Park. And after the game, on here sent us this voice note. Hi, Oshane. Just to give you uh, my thoughts on the, the Bowls and Rovers game last night that I was at. 
Um, but was it a, a nice tribute to as on front man Christy Dignan before the for the game and his, his daughter and the family were down there at the match. As for the game itself, the first half, both teams really sloppy in their in their passing. Um, looks like both both of the teams are suffering from the mid season break, trying to dust away the cobwebs. Nothing really to talk about. A lot of misplaced passes in the first half. Two good chances by Bowes. Keeper pulled off two fantastic saves. Uh, one from Abafey and one from Ackley Hyundai. Other than that, wasn't much happening in the in the game itself. Second half, though, I have to say, higher tempo by, by both teams. Rovers started off after the break, you know, on the front foot. Cross came in from the right. Bowes did well to, to defend it. Uh, Roddy Gaffney kept kept the play alive, rolled it back then to Sean Cavanagh, put in a pinpoint cross. But for Ruga to, to come in and score with his head. Good start for Rovers, bad start after the break for Bowles. And um, then you think, you know, just hold up a few minutes, just get back into the game. Then you can see the second goal not long after. Free kick by Jack Bourne, not clear properly, and unbelievably tremendous strike by Marcus Pilm. Volley top corner, gave Talbot no chance. Game looked dead and buried then for Bowles. They didn't look like they were going to create much until, uh, you know, an opportunist goal came. Um, again, Rovers, bad defending, didn't clear the lines. The ball dropped to Albafea, who uh, turned, snapshot, turned quickly, bang, ball into the bottom corner, gave Bowles a lifeline, got, them, got us back into the game, 2-1. Um, Rovers had a chance then to make it 3-1, didn't capitalise on it. Bowles ended up breaking down to the other end. Played in, Dylan Connolly, lovely ball into the path of uh, James Clark, and a nice knee finish into the corner. Overall, as I said, the first half wasn't the best, but the second half definitely lived up to expectations. Um, so it was nice that Paul was showed that grit and showed that determination coming from 2 0 down and get back into the game and taking a point from it. Rovers, on the other hand, probably kicking themselves out of being 2 0 up, cruising in the game and to come away with just a point. But um, yeah, overall, good evening for the game, good occasion, and uh, two all in the night. Oh, Shane, a more dramatic game here at Weavers Park tonight that you're unlikely to see. Goals, penalties, red cards, draw the lead for most of the game. Dundalk scraped themselves back into the game. Very quiet first half with either team getting a foothold in the game. Draw the shade in the first half. They'll be so disappointed overall in the night because they did have serious chances at 1-0 up. They ended up leading through Adam Foley from a corner earlier on after 20 minutes. 11 minutes, sorry, should I add. Swung around the back. He's been in great form, Adam Foley, his second goal in two games. Find themselves 1 0 up after 11 minutes. Into half time, you think Dundalk are going to come out strong in the second half because, as I said, they didn't really affect the game in the way Stephen O'Donnell would have wanted them to affect the first half. He came in, dropped it in, got on top in the second half, and had a fantastic chance to make it 2 0. We spoke about it during the game. Will it affect the game? Freddie Draper's chance from Alicia away out wide. Puts it on a play from, he kind of near scuffs it. It's the inside of Shepherd's posts. And Kevin Darty has his head in his hands because he knows 2-0 up and it's a, it's a different game and they probably are able to see out the game. With that, Pat Huben tonight, equaling the all-time record goal scoring charts. Is he able to break it tonight? We spoke before the game about the two number nines tonight. Freddie Draper and Pa Huben. It was Pa Huben's night. He gets Dundalk back into the game with a fantastic header in the 78th minute. You think, have they done enough to get a point out of the game in a game that they didn't really shade? But again, Huben steps up again. Okay, and does great to get into the box. He looks like he's kind of clipped from behind. He goes down easy enough. Referee points to the spot. Two minutes late after Dundalk equalising. Upsets Pa Huben, he gives Wogan no chance going to the keeper's left and Doc find themselves 2-1 up in a game that they didn't deserve to be level, never mind 2-1 up in. As I said, try to, to rue them chances they did in the end because they huffed and puffed then. Freddie Draper at the penalty incident was, was shown a red card. From looking on, it's something he said to the referee. We couldn't really make it out, obviously, from where we were, but straight red. He'll be a massive loss now for Drogheda. Dundalk able to hold out. They won't care. They weren't at it tonight. The supporters won't. The, st- the players, the staff, they got the win in the derby. Drogheda will be disgusted, as I said, with the chances they had. They even had another chance after the second one, but the Freddie Draper one was the clear-cut one to put them 2-0 up in the game. 
wasn't able to do it and just you always felt they might rule that chance with the quality of Pat Hoban up front. Um, finishes, yeah, 2-1 on the night and dock. Gareth McGlynn here reporting from a very humid Ryan McBride Brandywell Stadium where Derry City end up taking all three points thanks to a 2-0 win. Uh, both goals were very late in each half. Uh, first it was Jamie McGonagall in the first half, then Tiernan McGinty in the second half which really sets the top of the table clash up on Monday night against Shamrock Rovers. It really sets it up to be a classic. Um, Derry City were desperate for a home performance. Um, to be honest with you, it was very humid in, in, in the stadium and it kind of showed in the first half with both teams failing to get up into a high tempo. But it really kind of the game kicked into play when Olalabi came off and Keen Murphy came on. He was very, very light, lively and should have scored within seconds of entering the game when Mark Conley attempted to guide a header back to uh, Mar and he just nipped down in front of him. Now, had he started the game and got up to the pitch of the game, I think he would have got there quicker and possibly lobbed it over Mar. So, a real warning there for Derry City. Uh, but again, Murphy he went straight through and probed it just wide. And uh, it came even closer then a few minutes later when he smashed a shot off Mar's post. Now, it looked as if Mar didn't get it touched, but on the replay, you can clearly see that Mar actually gets a fingertip to it and puts it onto the post. So it was an unbelievable save. Um, and then it was Kevin Kustovic who curled a brilliant effort just past the upright, and that was seconds later. And you could hear the frustration from the, the Brandywell faithful coming in. Um, and it was, to be honest, to be honest, it, Derry did respond with a decent spell of pressure. And their best chance then came with Kevin and slipped in McGonagall, who shot well wide. Um, Cork City probably were the happier of the two teams going into the to, to, to added time in the first half. But then it all changed when McGonagall heading home from Kavanagh's pinpoint cross from the right-hand side. Uh, half time. Cork wouldn't have been too disappointed with the display. Rory Higgins would be happy with the half line, that that the, the sorry the score line, but not happy with the display. Um, Shane McElhenney in the second half failed to intercept a long ball uh, forward, and then Aaron Bulger went straight through one on one from the halfway line. Um, he raced through and towards Brian Maher, and he never really looked in control of the ball, and then ended up just kind of hitting a feeble shot which bobbled past the goalkeeper's um, post. Kind of Cork huffed and puffed then, didn't really create. Derry were much better in the second half defensively. Um, they brought on, uh, it, was, it was actually concerning in the 77th minute when Conley went off and Cole came on. That really kind of tightened things up. McEnough actually went off in the 84th minute as well and it was replaced by McGinty. So we're hoping for Monday night both players will be okay. Um and then, of course, the game on in the it must have been eighty ninth, ninetieth minute when young young McGinty on his debut, all the good work was done by Ben Doherty down the left hand side, who was very lively when he came on on the seventy seventh minute. He he played a one two down the left hand side, went to, to fake a shot, got past the centre half, got to the end line. The goalkeeper came out and he just probed the ball back. And who was there? But young McGinty, seventeen years of age, in the Brandywell debut goal it doesn't get any better than that he just side footed it past the goalkeeper uh, very good night for Derry City again as I said it sets up the top of the table clash now in Monday night in Tala against Rovers so that is the roundup from around the grounds Bulls what a comeback from them they were 2-0 down they drew 2 all with Shamrock Rovers Derry City 2-0 victors against Cork City Drogheda United losing 2-1 against Dundalk despite being 1-0 up for a long time in that game St. Pat's beating Shells by 1 goal to nil and of course UCD getting that 2-1 win against Sligo Rovers what a victory that was for them and again they came from behind Doyle with the winner for them uh, Clark with the equaliser and it was uh, David Cawley who put Sligo 1-0 up in that match. So what does that all mean for the table? Well, Shamrock Rovers are on top on 43 points. Derry second on 39 points. St. Pat's third on 38 points. Bohemians fourth on 35 points. Dundalk fifth on 35 points. Shelburne sixth on 30 points. Drogheda United seventh on 23 points. Sligo Rovers eighth on 23 points. And Cork City second from bottom on 21 points. Cork City looking over their shoulder but still a good distance between them and UCD who got the win but they're still 
only on nine points. In the first division, Bray Wanderers beat Kerry 3-2, Athlone overcoming, sorry, I beg your pardon, Treaty overcoming Athlone 2-0, Cove Ramblers beating Waterford FC 1-0. What a win that is for Shane Keegan's men. Galway 4-0 winners against uh, Longford Town and Finn Harps. Well, they lost 1-0 at home to Wexford FC. The table ramifications of that. Galway on top on 55 points. Waterford second on 42. You have to say to done deal now. Galway are going up in the first division. Cove Ramblers in third on 32. Athlone Town fourth on 29. Bray fifth on 28. Wexford sixth on 25. Treaty seventh on 23. Finn Harps eighth on 21. Longford Town ninth on 18. And Kerry FC at bottom of the table on six points. They remain on six points despite a valiant effort this evening you're hearing a lot a lot of a background noise that's because i am still in inchicor walking back to my car after st pat's victory against shelburne a podcast to come by the way on monday night slash tuesday morning dundalk taking on st pat's at oriel park on monday night shamrock rovers up against Derry sc there are also avenir sport uh, games over the weekend you can get the full detail on the fai app we will, by the way, have more on Monday about the Republic of Ireland women's team who are on their way to the World Cup. They did a 3-2 victory against Zambia uh, on Thursday night. Um, and Vera Pau will finalise her squad and name her World Cup squad on Thursday. We'll talk more about that on Monday slash Tuesday's podcast. As always, you can uh, give us your feedback, good, bad or indifferent, via Twitter at Extra Time News or at Oshin Langan. Don't forget Luke Jordan will be back during the week with a deeper dive into the League of Ireland on the extratime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. From the streets of Inchicore though, that's it for me. I'll talk to you on Monday night slash Tuesday morning. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.